on Case at 12. The night beat starts right now. And we begin tonight with a quick look at the COVID-19 numbers in Bear County. City officials today announcing 196 new cases with six new deaths. City officials also reporting an uptick in hospitalizations. Currently 233 patients are in local hospitals with 86 in the ICU and 42 on ventilators. In two other news, a rash of break ins at a retirement community as families worried about the safety of their loved ones. About a half dozen burglaries have been reported at the inn at Los Patios in two weeks. The night team's Patty Santos tells us what the managing company is doing and why family members are demanding more. There have been at least six break-ins here that I know about, including uh, the one that has happened to my mother once and to one of her close, two closest friends twice here. Mark Dankoff is worried about his mother, Vera, and the safety of those who live at the Inn at Los Patios near Nacogdoches Road and Loop 410 after a series of break-ins that started two weeks ago. Some sort of a blunt instrument was used uh, to move a relatively cheap lock and a relatively cheap wooden door away from an aging wooden frame. Jewelry and an iPhone were taken from the 99 year old's apartment on September 12th while she was at dinner. Detectives with SAPD Property Crimes Unit are investigating the cases. Retirement Center Management, which oversees the property, says it is working with police and also doing their own internal investigation into their employees. The break-ins they say happened while the apartments were unoccupied. Quote, no injuries occurred, but cash and jewelry were reported missing. I think it's important not only for my mother, but for everyone else who lives in this community uh, to be protected and for their families to know that they are being protected. The managing company says it is installing cameras in the hallways, fixing the broken front gate and adding a security to walk the property. Dankoff is demanding more. We're pretty much insisting at this point uh, that she get a steel door that has a solid core uh, and a steel frame uh, in a state-of-the-art lock. He says in the two years she's lived there, there's never been issues, but this has him really worried about her and others being hurt. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. New on the night beat, a Gonzalez County man was arrested by the FBI in San Antonio this week. He's accused of providing support to ISIS and discussing carrying out attacks here in the U.S. Jalen Molina, who also refers to himself as Abdur Rahim, faces a charge of conspiracy to provide material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization. That's according to an unsealed criminal complaint filed in San Antonio. Molina was taken into custody yesterday and is scheduled to make an appearance in federal court early next week. Details of his alleged crimes, which include posting manuals online on how to train with an AK-47 and craft bombs, those documents can be found at ksat.com. We also want to let you know San Antonio police are searching for a man who was last seen on the city's northeast side. A clear alert has been issued for 28-year-old Anthony Eugene Smith. He was last seen yesterday in a black 2014 Chevy Equinox in the 12,000 block of Starcrest Drive. The license plate reads DHX7084. If you have any information regarding Smith, contact the San Antonio Police Department at 210-207-7660. By a 12 to 2 vote, the Texas Historical Commission today voted down the idea of moving the Alamo Cenotaph. The Cenotaph, which was commissioned in 1936 and bears the names of fallen Alamo defenders, has remained a focal point in the approximate $400 million overhaul of Alamo Plaza. Plans were in place to move it several hundred feet south around where the bandstand sat before it was removed in May. A Cibolo father is thankful to be alive tonight after he nearly died from cardiac arrest about a month ago. He's been in the hospital ever since, but he's alive because of the quick actions of two off duty police officers that day. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with the man's daughter and the officers who saved his life. I thought maybe that was the last time that I was going to see my dad. Sabrina Brandonicio was brought to tears recounting the moment her father, 60-year-old Sabino Brandonicio, nearly died August 12th in this shirt's Whataburger parking lot. The father-daughter duo worked together as cooks, but this particular morning, Sabino was late for his shift. 
He's never late, so that day a co-worker told me that uh, my father was outside. As soon as she learned that her father was here but was unconscious in the parking lot, she ran outside, and that's when she saw things were bad. Fortunately, Church Police Officer Danielle Apgar and her husband, Cibolo Police Officer Joshua Apgar, were just getting off their night shift and pulled in to get some breakfast. At that point, we went and checked on him. He was uh, on his side, so Danielle rolled him over. Um, we checked for a pulse and noticed we didn't have a pulse, so immediately we started in on a CPR. His heart stopped, and he was getting really cold already but um, they just kept doing CPR. Because of their quick actions, Sabino's pulse came back before he was rushed to the hospital by EMS. And they told us he needed to have a emergency heart surgery, but there was only a 10% a chance that he would make it. After a week of being in an induced coma, Sabino woke up. Sabrina says she's forever grateful for the married couple. And I feel like they were two angels sent by God. The officers have since been recognized for their heroic actions in both Shirts and Cibolo, but they say that's not the best part. When we actually see a need and we're capable of fulfilling that need. That we made a difference in his life and were able to help not just him but his family, that, that was the most rewarding part of it. Now, Sabino is still on dialysis and still in the hospital, but is expected to be discharged within the next couple of days. His family has been told that he should be up and running just as normal by Christmas. Live in Cibolo, Jaffe Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffe. Turning to the upcoming election, the League of Women Voters heading up a voter registration event at the Pearl today. It was just one of many registration events happening around the city on National Voter Registration Day. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to informed and active participation in government. Their drive up event was set up today in the Pearl parking lot near Bike World underneath Highway 281. Elizabeth Woodhull with the League told us today why she's so passionate about making sure people have the information they need. People are paying attention and they want to vote and that that is not always the case. So we want to be able to um, take advantage of this when people are paying attention and get them the information they need and encouragement they need to go to the polls with confidence and vote. Of course, the Bear County Elections Office was also participating in Voter Registration Day. County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan shared some advice for potential voters who may have moved within Bear County and aren't sure of their registration status. They can go on Texas Online and you can change your address basically on the Secretary of State's website. You don't need to submit a new card to us. We get that information and we import it into our system. The last day to register to vote in Texas is October 5th. The two women vying for the Precinct 3 Bear County Commissioner's Court seat facing off tonight in a candidate forum. They talked about their priorities for the county, why they believe they should be elected this November, and property taxes. I think one thing that voters really need to uh, be aware of when it comes to me is that I have almost 20 years of experience advocating for members of the community, first as a congressional aide and now as a practicing attorney. Um, it's, I've basically um, been uh, in a position to professionally advocate for people. I think uh, the voters of Precinct 3 need to know that I'm a fiscal conservative at heart, and that comes from the small business experience that I've honed over 25 years. I think a minimum requirement for this position has to be somebody who has met a payroll, not just for one person as a sole practitioner, but many employees. Hey, coming up in our next half hour, we're going to revisit this forum with another look at tonight's candidates debate. The entire debate, by the way, is also online at KSAT.com. Ad addressing climate change with shade. The city of San Antonio hopes to address the problem with a new competition. The night team's Tiffany Huertas with how it could impact those who live and work in the downtown area. It's pretty hard to find uh, some of the shade to get under. Brendan Ryan works in downtown. The Texas heat forces him to rush to the bus stop. I usually try to get as fast as possible to the bus. Not enough shade is also a problem when it rains. Right now we're lucky to be under this, but all like right here, it's usually hard to have any shade. A new design competition is hoping to fix this problem. It also hopes to address climate change. In San Antonio, it's really hot. The sun is, is very hot, and so we need to have uh, something that they can offset that heat and, and 
trees are the best way to do that. But when you can't plant a tree, you want to do architectural devices. The competition challenges design teams to create shade structures that the city can use. The shade structures should provide at least 80% shade coverage to sidewalks and corners. Councilman Roberto Trevino's office teamed up with the American Institute of Architects of San Antonio and Centro San Antonio for the project. This is important as part of our overall infrastructure as a city as we promote more and more uh, pedestrians uh, being able to walk all over our city, more people biking all over our city. The competition focused on three sites in downtown that are in need of shading solutions. When they built the buildings, they should have had more roofs over it. Yeah. But I, I think that's a really great idea, honestly. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT. 12 news. Now there are cash prizes for the top three winners. The final design could be used in future city projects. You can see the different entries and provide feedback online. We have a link on ksat.com. I want to bring you some late breaking news now. A man shot and killed on the city's west side found dead behind the wheel of a car. This happened at a shopping center near Ellison and Petranco Road. San Antonio police say the suspected shooter took off in an SUV. It is unclear if they were alone. We'll bring you more information as we receive it. The president this week continuing to minimize the severity of the coronavirus pandemic as cases continue to rise in more than 30 states where the U.S. stands amid the pandemic. Next. The coronavirus has taken more than 200,000 American lives and cases are on the rise again in 33 states, Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. The United States with just 4% of the world's population accounting for 20% of the world's COVID-19 deaths. The president commenting little today about the grim milestone, but did say it could have been a lot worse. ABC's Romina Puga has more. President Trump said little to mark today's horrific milestone of 200,000 Americans killed by the coronavirus. Well, I think it's a shame. I think if we didn't do it properly and do it right, you'd have two and a half million deaths. The U.S. has 4% of the world's population and 20% of the world's COVID-related deaths. Tuesday, the American Medical, Hospital and Nurses Association issuing a joint statement saying COVID-19 is affecting Americans at a rate that represents a nearly worst case scenario. With the number of cases increasing in 33 states and Puerto Rico, the president speaking as if the pandemic is a thing of the past. During his Ohio rally Monday night, he said incorrectly that the virus only really affects older Americans with pre-existing conditions. Well, elderly, elderly people with heart problems and other problems. If they have other problems, that's what it really affects. That's it. And he added, also incorrectly, that young people are basically immune. Dr. Fauci saying Tuesday that's just not true. Is the elderly and people at any age with underlying conditions? Right underlining any age. Each number added to that death toll an American life, a family forever changed. Four out of those 200,000 counted are from the Beltran family, who got sick with COVID after a get together at a home in Phoenix. Father, mother and two sons dying. We did everything together. It's hard. More than half of my family is gone. Joe Biden saying today it that didn't means, have to be this bad. It means there are empty chairs and dining room tables and kitchen tables that weeks and months ago were filled with a loved one, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister. And at a rally in Pennsylvania Tuesday night, thousands of the president's supporters packing the venue, most not wearing masks. All attendees required to sign a disclaimer that they voluntarily assume all risks related to exposure of COVID-19. And with fall stoking worries of a second wave combined with flu season, health officials are pleading with Americans to wear their masks and avoid crowds. In Los Angeles, Romina Puga, ABC News. Take a live look outside with live cam, a very nice 75 degrees out there. Some nice weather today. Yeah, and it's been, you know, I like the change. Mm -hmm. I'm fine if we have no more 100 degree days for a while. I'm with you on that. You know, odds are against it. And usually this time of year, if we hit triple digits, it would be a record tying or record breaking day. So we're starting to fall into that category this time of year, but we're not going to be near triple digits anytime soon. Low 90s? Yeah, that's right around the corner. As the remnants of beta exits, it leaves in its wake 
lot of rainfall near Houston. Take a look at the rainfall estimates and you see around San Antonio. We actually picked up about six tenths of an inch at the airport and other parts of Bear County had similar estimates according to the radar. But you go to Houston and radar estimates there right along 290 and I-45 on that south side of town particularly are on the order of 12 to 16 inches of rainfall estimated by the Doppler radar and it's still raining and that's why we have some flash flood warnings far to the east of us in the vicinity of Houston, especially just north of the city still in Harris County though and these bands continue to work their way through. They come and they go, but they're very slow moving because the remnants of beta is very slow moving the steering flow aloft just isn't all that strong to really get this moving very fast, but it's just a remnant low right now and still dumping rainfall and it's going to continue to rain in parts of East Texas, basically from Houston, but especially eastward toward Beaumont, Port Arthur and then up into Louisiana and Arkansas. This, the rain shield extends now all the way into northern Mississippi and parts of western Tennessee. And as we go through time around here, our sky is just going to continually clear. I know we've got a decent amount of clouds out there right now, a little blanket at night, but we'll get into the sunshine again tomorrow and temperatures are going to respond as a result, but still a lot of moisture. Far East Texas stretching all the way well, basically into the Ohio Valley area. How much more rain? We're probably looking at three to five inches far east of us. I mean, we're talking east of Houston here all the way up into Louisiana, an additional three to five San Antonio. Our rain chances look like the big old goose egg, unfortunately, going forward here. Once the system's out of here, there's nothing to replace it to give us any good hope for rainfall. Look at this 82 our high temperature today. Dare I say we had a little taste of fall the past couple of days. It's not going to last though. Temperatures are going to be on the upswing right now. We're at 75 dew point is 67. So despite that northerly breeze, still noticeable humidity in the air and you can see right here on the map, the very defined swirl that counterclockwise swirl indicating the center of circulation of what was tropical storm, then tropical depression beta. We're on the back side of it, so north wind at 10 miles per hour did pick up a little bit today. It was a little breezy at times, but that's the windiest will be basically for the rest of the week and into next week. Temperatures right now, some low 70s under the clouds. LaGrange and Gonzales at 72. Del Rio's at 81, but earlier today, Del Rio actually made it into the lower 90s because along the Rio Grande, we had nothing but sunshine during the day, whereas eastward, we had the clouds and even a few early morning showers. So let's go to tomorrow morning. 69 at Catula, 68 in New Braunfels, low to mid 60s in the hill country. Here in San Antonio, I'm thinking about 68. Then we get into the afternoon with sunshine, back to the 90 degree mark, Eagle Pass, Laredo even up to 93. But under the clouds farther to the east, LaGrange probably stuck in the upper 70s. Same with College Station in Houston, a little closer to 80. You get around Bear County and surrounding communities, Lavernia 84, Castroville tomorrow afternoon 85, and a little closer to 80 in Bernie. So temperatures are going to start their climb tomorrow. Despite some morning clouds, a lot of afternoon sunshine. And then we go all the way through Thursday, Friday and the weekend. And it's a pretty persistent, sunny and dry pattern that's going to be affecting us with those temperatures on the upswing into the low 90s for the weekend. However, <laughs> however, there are indications that we could get a little cold front here by the middle of next week. It could hit us late Tuesday and we may feel the effects of it by Wednesday. So nice. stay tuned for that. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Adam. All right. So for those that actually got to go into Cowboys Stadium, yes. enjoy the game. They really didn't need the entire seat for the end because they were probably on the edge of it. Oh, you know it. And well, like everybody was even at home. But in this case, it looks like Cowboys owner Jerry Jones is looking to increase the attendance possibilities in AT&T Stadium. When we come back, you'll hear from the Cowboys owner and Texas high school football has lost a legend. Texas high school football has lost a legend today with the passing of Somerset High School head coach Sonny Detmer. Detmer had been in and out of the hospital with a number of health issues, including pneumonia, but was thought to be doing much better until his sudden passing this morning. He was not only a coach, but a father to two football standouts in Ty and Coy Detmer. Ty would star for Southwest High School here in San Antonio before going on to BYU, where he wore the Heisman Trophy in 1990 before a 14-year NFL career with six different teams, while his brother Coy was a high school star in Mission, Texas, before he moved to Colorado and 
and later the NFL, where he played for both the Eagles and the Vikings over a 10-year span. Sonny will compile a record of 235 wins, 141 losses, and two ties in 35 years of coaching. But Sonny's legacy is much more than that as a husband, father, and mentor to so many young and old. He personified all the good things about coaching. He was a hard worker. He was always willing to work with anybody. Uh, when you won a game, he was always the first to compliment you. And if you beat him, he would always be one of the first ones to come up and tell you, great job, and he is going to be sorely missed. San Antonio uh, High School football lost a great man today. Matter of fact, the state of Texas lost a great high school football coach today. Obviously, if you know Sonny Detmer, the man is introduced as the great Sonny Detmer. And um, I, I truly believe he's one of the Mount Rushmore's of, of Texas high school football. Our prayers are with the Detmer family and the entire Bulldog Nation. Sonny Detmer leaves us at the age of 76. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys set an NFL attendance record during the COVID-19 pandemic with an announced attendance of 21,708 fans during their home opener on Sunday against the Atlanta Falcons. And during his appearance on his weekly radio show today, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones said he would like to increase his gate on his next home game against the Browns on October the 4th. We were quite uh, pleased with how it worked out there Sunday. Uh, can we do better? Of course we can. But uh, uh, can we have more fans? Yes, we can. And we can do it safely. And we will adjust accordingly. We're doing some exciting things out there, and I think the NFL is going to have a big year in spite of the COVID. Now, we thought the Cowboys were bringing back former Cowboys lineman Ron Leary to help replace Leo Collins, who's put on the injured reserve list due to the hip issues. But for some reason, the deal fell through. The Cowboys face the Seahawks this Sunday in Seattle. Texas Longhorns will kick off play in the Big 12 this Saturday afternoon when they travel to Lubbock to face the Red Raiders of Texas Tech. The Horns are coming off a 59-3 route of UTEP two weeks ago at home, while the Red Raiders barely survived Houston Baptist 35-33 because of a massive outbreak of positive coronavirus tests on the team. In order to protect themselves, the Longhorns will not have a team meal on Friday. Instead, they will take individual meals to their rooms where they will not have roommates on this road trip. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Obviously, this is our, our first road game, so it'll be interesting to see uh, kind of the differences and the nuances that come with uh, social distancing on the road. Uh, I think it's it's definitely a plus that we're not going to have to face a full capacity uh, Lubbock Stadium. Obviously, they can get very rowdy. Now, the Red Raiders' top running back, Sir Arik Thompson, has been arrested for a street racing incident that occurred back in June, although he is expected to play on Saturday for the 2.30 kickoff. Jeff Trailer will try and do something this Saturday that no other UTSA coach has been able to do. Next. After UTSA had their game this week against Memphis canceled after the Tigers came down with too many positive coronavirus tests, now the Roadrunners will face Middle Tennessee and the Alamo Dome in their Conference USA opener. That's where Jeff Trailer will try and become the first head coach in UTSA history to begin his career on campus with three straight wins. That's following the double overtime victory against Texas State in their home opener over Stephen F. Austin. Quarterback Frank Harris is now the reigning Conference USA Offensive Player of the Week. After throwing for 269 yards and rushing for another 104 yards for a total of three touchdowns, he now leads the FBS in total touchdowns with five and rushing touchdowns with five as well. I give out a credit to Coach Lonnie, Coach Trailer, uh, the O-line, and everybody else. Uh, like I always say, uh, they deserve all the credit. Um, I get too much of the credit, um, but they do all the dirty work, and I just get the glory. So, but it's just a blessing to go out there and play. The Blue Raiders have gotten off to a slow start, being outscored in their first two games, 89-14. That's why the Roadrunners are six and a half point favorites for kickoff on Friday night, 7 p.m. in the Dome. Danny Casper has resigned as a head basketball coach at Texas State University. His resignation comes in the wake of an investigation and allegations made by former players that claim he made racially biased comments. The school announced that Terrence Johnson will serve as the men's head basketball coach for the coming season. Good volleyball matchup tonight between a pair of 1-0 teams. Churchill hosting Madison. Mavericks up two sets to none, but the Chargers battling back in the third. Kara Clark powers one down the middle that ties it up at 15 all but the Mavericks end this set on a 10-0 run first is Angelina Rodriguez over the over to Siobhan responding for the cross court kill what a shot there and then match point Breonna Johnson beats the block for the clincher Madison takes it in a clean sweep three sets to nine it's the first win over Churchill in 20 years more highlights and reaction coming up tonight on our website that was a great one 20 years 20 years yes wow what a milestone yeah thank you Greg We'll be right back. What has the pandemic been like for one of the city's most unique theme parks? It's one of the topics that Gordon Hartman talked about in our KSAT Q&A recorded 
during the 6 o'clock news. He called it one of the toughest decisions he has ever had to make. The last time we talked to him on KSAT Q&A, we were talking about Gordon Hartman and the decision not to open Morgan's Wonderland this year. I'm glad to welcome Gordon Hartman back with us uh, to have a conversation because on Friday, you're doing something you have never done at Morgan's Wonderland before. You've had galas before, but this one that's airing on KSAT on Friday is one that everybody can participate in everyone can you know our good friends you guys have been fantastic on allowing us an opportunity to have a virtual gala for a whole hour on uh, this coming friday from 7 to 8 p.m and it is something that so many people have worked very hard on uh, to bring a lot of special guests some very famous people will be involved in it even even uh, adam kasky will be uh, MC, so you know it's got to be a great uh, evening with a guy like that. <laughs> it'll be it'll be unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a good uh, word I would use. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about the gala and how the average person at home can participate in it. Well, the neat thing about it is that everyone can watch and be able to learn a lot about what is up with Morgan's Wonderland. Uh, as you know, we were not able, as you mentioned, uh, to open. Uh, we're also not able to open Morgan's Inspiration Island, and we have built Morgan's Wonderland Sports, which has not been able to be open. But we're also building a, a new camp and also a multi-assistance center. So we have a lot of different things going on, even though COVID has not allowed things to be normal. But uh, this is an opportunity for people to learn about all these things, what we're doing, where we're going in the future. And if they are inclined, they can also be a participant and allowing us an opportunity to expand uh, by by being involved both financially and also by giving their time if they wish to. And talk a little bit about how Morgan's Wonderland has weathered this pandemic, because of course some people might on the surface think, well, it's a it's a theme park. That's something that people can go without. But Morgan's Wonderland is a lot more than that. You provide a sense of community, a place of belonging for people who might not have that anywhere else in San Antonio. So how is your organization really weathering this storm? Well, you're exactly right. It has really changed uh, things for everyone, of course, and in particular, people with special needs. Uh, Morgan's Wonderland is a place that they know is always there for them. It's a place of inclusion. Uh, it's a place that's ultra accessible. So no matter how acute someone's special need may be, they can play right alongside someone who does not have a special need. And so it's always been there. And this year, it couldn't be there. And so what we did is we have spent a lot of energy and time going out to neighborhoods, uh, doing parades, going into, uh, Joy has visited hundreds of homes of people who have special needs so that we could be out there in the community as best we could during this unique time. Uh, Mortgage One Land will come back and when it comes back, it will be better and stronger uh, because of not only what it represents, but the people who make it so special, the people who visit, but also the people who are working every day to continue to expand our programs uh, to bring about a full element of inclusion in this community. So Morgan's Wonderland was really a dream that you had because of your daughter, Morgan. The gala on Friday, also a birthday celebration for her as it is every year. I know the one year that I hosted it, I loved seeing her face light up and just every, just the love that was in the room when that birthday cake was, was brought out and, and through the entire thing. How has she and others in the community weathered the storm without Morgan's there? Um, Morgan has had a little bit of a tough time with it in that she's um, uh, had a hard time not being around her friends and being able to just have that interaction, if you will. And we've heard those stories from a lot of people. Uh, and that's why, uh, Steve, we really wanted to, number one, uh, go out to the community, as I mentioned earlier, but also make sure we could put out this virtual gala on KSAT 12 because there are so many people who are involved with Morgan's Wonderland, not just here in San Antonio, but throughout the state, throughout the country. And we even have people uh, throughout the world who will be watching this on the different apps that are possible. So this is an opportunity for people to kind of catch up with where we are. And as I mentioned, uh, with where we're going, because we have so many things on board to continue our whole idea of inclusion. It's so important to us. You talked a little bit about how the special needs community has been uniquely impacted throughout the past six months. If somebody out there has someone who has special needs in their life, or maybe they don't, but they still want to help out, what ways would you recommend to reach out and to try to be that helping force during this time? 
Well, there's a lot of people who are just lonely right now. And uh, I would suggest that people reach out to someone who they know if, whether they have a special need or not, but if they do have a special need, there is a lot of loneliness out there right now. And so uh, just calling someone, talking to someone, going by and of course, keeping uh, safe distance, but uh, just showing that you care is something I think more important than anything right now, to be honest with you. Uh, we receive uh, from time to time uh, correspondence from uh, caregivers and parents and brothers and sisters of those with special needs who have said, is there any way y'all can do something? And what we try to do is go out and just say, hey, we're here. And if, if the average individual, anybody can do that, we don't have to do it. And so I would welcome everyone to get involved in that way. Absolutely. That's great advice. Okay. I, I want to talk about your battle that I don't know a lot of people know about with coronavirus, with COVID-19. You uh, had COVID just a few months ago. Are you better now? Are you still feeling the effects? And what was it like? Well, the first week was, of course, pretty tough. The second week was not as bad. And that's been eight weeks now. I do get aftershocks every once in a while. I do get the chills every once in a while. And sometimes I just get extremely tired, which is unusual for me. Uh, but so I'm pretty much over it. But, you know, uh, with everything that like this that occurs, it, it also allows an opportunity to open up. And, you know, there's people who are, are uh, not as fortunate as I was uh, in respect to the degree that they've had COVID-19. And it's allowed me an opportunity to now uh, be involved in giving plasma, uh, which is so desperately needed. And uh, it's something I've really taken on in a, in a big way. And and really hope that a lot of people, some 35, 40,000 people who are in this community who have now recovered from COVID-19, at least look at the opportunity of giving plasma so that they can help those in the hospital get out sooner, hopefully. Yeah, because frankly, we don't have enough people who've recovered that are giving blood right now. We, well, in respect to giving plasma, that's correct. Plasma, the, correct. Uh, they're looking at about 75 uh, volunteers per day, and they're only getting about half that right now. And, you know, when I first looked into it, I thought, well, you know, what's it going to take? How long does it take? It takes about an hour. Uh, the people are extremely nice. It's very, it's a very simple process. Um, you know, you, you, and when you leave, you feel just fine. It's different than giving blood because you're getting your blood back. You're just taking your plasma. So, I mean, you, you go right back to doing what you were doing after you're done. So spending one hour, one hour out of your day uh, allows you to produce enough plasma to help as many as five people in the hospital. And so it's a small it's a it's a small amount of time to be a big opportunity to a lot of people to feel better much sooner. So I would it all it's going to take, if you will, 10 percent, one out of 10, only one out of 10 of the people who have recovered would go to the blood bank and give plasma. They would have more than enough, not just for now, but in case we get a surge later uh, during flu season or during when it gets colder. So there's really a need to focus on this right now and i hope that people will join in, in respect to giving plasma if they've had COVID 19. and important to note there are thousands of people in that position in san antonio who have survived it who have the opportunity to make that very important donation i also want to say something before we let you go gordon you know up friday to me it, with all that's going on and such for lack of a better word, bad news that we hear on a daily basis. I'm looking forward to Friday at seven o'clock because those are inspirational stories right there. That's a community, a country, a world that has rallied around uh, one place. And so I'm really looking forward to Friday at seven right here on KSAT. So thank you for your time. Steve, it's gonna be an incredible event. Uh, Adam, uh, I'm sure will do a great job and it's just so, you're right, it's gonna be an incredibly positive hour. I hope everybody joins us at seven o'clock on Friday. And we have all those details on how to watch on our website as well as Morgan Wonderland's website as well. Gordon, thanks for your time. Thanks guys. We'll be right back. With 45 mile per hour winds, Tropical Storm Beta made landfall late last night on the Texas coast, dumping up to 10 inches of rain on eastern Texas overnight. With reports of flash flooding, Beta is expected to stall for the next 24 hours as heavy rain continues, leaving some areas with up to 20 inches. ABC's Elwin Lopez is in Houston with more on the conditions. Slow moving beta dumping heavy rain over southeast Texas. We are going to be in this weather uh, pattern uh, for the next 24 hours. People need to be very patient. It's moving very slowly, about two uh, miles per hour. In Houston, nearly 100 river. water evacuations from roadways. Rising water cutting off busy streets. 
This highway turned into a lake. Abandoned cars swamped, trapping drivers for hours. People using high water trucks to pull stranded drivers to safety. Cars are flooded right now, so me and these group of guys, we just decided that we had lifted trucks, so we might as well just help some people get through the water, pull them out. The mayor of Houston asking people not to drive through floodwaters and put first responders at risk. You're not helping yourself. Uh, you could possibly drown. If not, at a very minimum, you can stall. Uh, and you're just going to create problems for yourself. And then the first responders and others are going to be out there uh, doing our best to, uh, to rescue you. Beta will continue to weaken, but the rain won't let up. But this storm will move out of here tomorrow and into Louisiana in parts already ravaged by Hurricane Laura just weeks ago. In Houston, Elwin Lopez, ABC News. Six Louisville police officers are under investigation for their actions the night Brianna Taylor died. Police shot and killed Taylor in March when they entered her apartment using a no-knock warrant. On Tuesday, the Louisville Police Department said it is conducting an internal investigation that includes two of the officers who fired into Taylor's home and another who secured a search warrant. The department will look into if any of the six officers violated any police policies. A grand jury is expected to hand down its decision soon on whether or not to charge the officers involved in the deadly shooting of Breonna Taylor. Meanwhile, one of those officers involved in the Breonna Taylor case may have added to the tension in Louisville with a late night email. In a mass email sent at 2 a.m. this morning, Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly defended his actions and criticized city leadership. He wrote his fellow Louisville police officers should not have to face down thugs. Mattingly complained police should not be degraded, yelled and cursed at for making a mistake under stress. Sergeant Mattingly's attorney confirmed his client sent the email. He argues his client was just following orders that night from his superior officers. During a live streamed candidate forum tonight on KSAT.com, the two women vying for the Precinct 3 Bear County Commissioner's Court seat faced off in a debate. Among the topics, whether Bear County residents should have a say about aquifer protection plans. Take a look. Aquifer protection is, um, is, is very, very important. That's something that we need to focus on now and in the future. If we don't have water, we don't have anything else. Um, I think it's imperative that Bear County has a role in aquifer protection. Uh, I think the aquifer is such an important resource that we need to work with uh, local stakeholders like the city, Edwards Aquifer Protection Agency and, and SAWS also to figure out the best way to protect the aquifer. We need to make sure that we have a source of revenue that's going to go to uh, continue the aquifer protection program that, that, that's been in place for years and that's been very successful. Um, but it, it's something that's crucial. Um, I'm, I'm glad that City Council has reached um, a, a solution, at least for now. Um, I'm not sure how successful it will be. Hopefully it will go according to plan, uh, but I think it's something important that we, we need to address immediately. I don't think it's something that we should put off um, for any length of time. Trish DeBerry. So Steve, you made a very important point. I mean, the aquifer is still San Antonio and Bear County's sole source of drinking water. And so we've got to be doing everything in our power to be able to protect it. Although SAWS has diversified and we certainly looked at the desal plan, we looked at the Vista Ridge pipeline project, it still is the main source by which we get our drinking water. So it's critical that we protect it for not only the health of our community, but for economic development. So I'm gonna go back to another point I made. I think it's shameful that the citizens of Precinct 3 do not have the ability to be able to vote on the reauthorization of protection of the aquifer, as well as the funding of linear parks. And I think the $100 million over 10 years is a stopgap solution. Um, not to mention the fact that during a down economy, the last thing the city of San Antonio should be doing is taking on more debt. And that's exactly what they're doing. And so the citizens of Precinct 3 have been forced to basically stomach the solution that's been put forth and instead vote on a job training program that, like I said, begs more questions than it answers at this point because the devil is in the details, as well as pick maybe the fact that they want to reauthorize via and transit five years down the road when we don't even know what the needs of this community are going to be in five years, not to mention the fact 
Typically, the average person in Precinct 3 does not ride the bus and does not have a culture of riding the bus. They value their parks. They value the aquifer. And so, yes, at some point, um, as we dig into the budget, if there's an opportunity to be able to offer additional aquifer protection, uh, you can count on the fact that I will be there as that vote. You can watch the entire debate right now on KSAT.com or stream on your KSAT TV app. Turning now to weather, had a beautiful day out there today as we sit at 75 degrees as of now, Adam. Yeah, and you know, speaking of the aquifer, actually, it's nice to see that it's up today, up half a foot. That's right, we're about three and a half feet above the September average, but we're still in stage one watering restrictions. Mold is moderate as a result of the recent rainfall, ragweed as well, and then fall elm on the low end. All right, let's get to it out there. Take a look at... Uh, a little explanation that we have here of what happened earlier today, the autumnal equinox at 8.31 a.m. Now, the summer solstice is when the sun's direct rays are over the Tropic of Cancer. Earlier this morning, over the equator, equinox equal nights. We have just about equal daytime and nighttime. That happened earlier today. So astronomically speaking, it's autumn, it's fall. It's not going to feel like it, though, over the next few days, I'll tell you that. There is hope for a cold front, though, by the middle of next week. You look at the profile here of what was Tropical Storm Beta over the last eight hours and still dumping some moderate to heavy rainfall in parts of far east Texas and stretching all the way up into Arkansas and even western Tennessee. It's going to continue to do that. It's going to weaken, but it's going to continue to do that. High temperatures today were all across the board. We were stuck in the low 70s in much of east Texas. 73 College Station was the high temperature, 82 in San Antonio. But 91 in Del Rio, 90 in Laredo, that's a result of the sunshine off to the west, low clouds, and even some periodic rain farther to the east. LaGrange topped out at 72, and that's our current reading. Right now, we're 74 in San Antonio, down to 70 in Rock Springs, hanging on to 79 in Carrizo Springs and Catula. Northerly breeze on the backside of the remnants of Beta, now just a remnant low with a few gusts around 30 miles per hour closer to the center of it, but that's about it. Dew points are up, they're in the 60s, so we're feeling that mugginess in the air, and that's going to limit our cooling as well. Temperatures can only fall down to that dew point at night and not fall past it. So I think we'll be in the upper 60s tomorrow morning. 68 degrees, a little more cloud cover to start the day than what we'll have in the afternoon. Mid 80s for a high temperature, but those of you along the Rio Grande, probably around 90 or in the lower 90s. And get used to a very sunny stretch here because the sunshine is going to dominate our weather pattern through Thursday, Friday, the weekend, even into next week. And we're gradually going to warm into the lower 90s as a result. But there is indications that we could have a fall like cold front hit us the middle of next week. So we're in the equinox or today was the equinox. Is yes, early this morning. By the way, Equinox also a very good album by Styx. Okay. <laughs> in case you're Thank you for wondering. that, Steve. Yeah. Yes. Trivia. Well, video doorbells help us track package deliveries, see who's visiting, even talk to them. But which doorbell should get your dollars? We'll help you choose coming up next. Video doorbells, not only do they help you keep an eye on your package deliveries, you can socially distance and still talk to someone at your door. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with information to help you choose. Brandon Murphy's video doorbell saw it all, capturing his neighbor's car being stolen in the middle of the night. We save five days worth of camera feeds off of the smart doorbell. Sure enough, it was on there. Busted. The evidence helped police return the car. Video doorbells are ringing up huge sales. Global sales are expected to hit $1.4 billion by 2023. Video doorbells offer security and peace of mind and if you sync it up to your smart speaker, you can answer the door with just your voice. So how do you set up a hands-free front door experience? Consumer Report says it's best to keep it in the tech family. There are video doorbells that claim they work with digital assistance, but they might not 
offer all the features to ensure compatibility, just stay within the same product ecosystem or product family. If you're a Google Home user, CR recommends the Nest Hello video doorbell paired with the Google Nest Hub Max smart speaker. Motion detected at the front door. If you have an Amazon smart speaker, go with the Ring Video Doorbell 3 and the Amazon Echo Show. Video doorbells can be hacked, so setting up two-factor authentication will help protect you. Someone is at the front door. Once you're all set up, you can answer the door and socially distance. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Hey, coming up, the reason why NASA says it's time to send the first woman to the moon after the break. Well, check this out. NASA is unveiling plans to send the first woman to the moon. The $28 billion plan aims to land a woman and a man on the moon in 2024. The trip would mark the first time humans would land on the lunar surface since 1972. One NASA administrator said the moon mission would be for scientific discovery, economic benefits, and inspiration for a new generation of explorers. The astronauts will spend nearly a week collecting samples and conducting experiments. The mission will also allow for a slow buildup of infrastructure and the development of the Artemis Base Camp, which would be for the long-term moon exploration mission. A base camp Very on cool. the moon. Mm -hmm. That is pretty cool. All right, that does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.